Sustainable Together program. Um, and our facilitator this evening will be Busi Tlamini, and I am here with Makazi Bompateleni Makolule. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. And good afternoon. And I'm not sure where people are calling in from. Maybe good morning, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Wusi Lamini, as Claire has mentioned, and I'd like to welcome our speakers and the panelists for today. So we have three wonderful panelists here who are sharing their knowledge with us today. And I'll go through sort of, yeah, just a bio of each uh, before we open up. So as we get started, uh, wanting to welcome Makati Vompateleni Makaulule, who is the founder of Mopo Foundation, that's now registered as, as Domola Mopo, the voice of the earth, which is a community-based organization dedicated to protecting nature in all its forms, rooted on the protection of Zwipo, the sacred indigenous forest, uh, the seeds and the food systems and creating space for intergenerational learning. So for 33 years, uh, Makazi has been working with the vendor elders to transfer indigenous knowledge to the younger generation. She calls elders the libraries of knowledge. She was born when her father was 74 years old and he was a traditional healer, a farmer and a traditional leader. Our next speaker is Method Gundiza, uh, who's trained as a chartered certified accountant and is the director of Earthlow Foundation with offices in Johannesburg. He completed a three-year international training course on earth uh, jurisprudence facilitated by the Gaia Foundation in the UK, which inspired him to start facilitating community dialogues in Zimbabwe and in South Africa to revive indigenous knowledge and food systems. These community dialogues have led to a process of reviving lost and underutilized traditional seeds and traditional ecological governance systems. They've also increased communities' confidence in their knowledge, which helps them mitigate the effects of climate change and of corporate and government control over food systems. And our last speaker will be Mvoselelo Ngoya. Um, Mvoselelo and his wife have founded the Bonagude um, Foundation, a small-scale agricultural farm uh, in the hills of Pateni in Richmond, KwaZulu Natal in 2019. When he's not growing imboya, pumpkins, amadumbe, uh, he's an associate professor in development studies at the University of KwaZulu Natal, where he spends most of his time thinking about food and its politics. Um, his two daughters, Halala and Nala, keep him grounded literally and figuratively. So with that, I'm just wanting to really just welcome all three of our panelists and everyone else who's participating in this. Uh, we're hoping to really have an engaged conversation over the next few hours together. And with that, I'd like to uh, invite Von Pateleni to offer a ceremony as an opening to this process. Can I check? We might need to unmute Makazi. Thank you. Ah. Uh. Tingwana mutuk. Mopo. Atsumoba toni. Nabatamoni. Tinem patele. Makaururi. Wana wabewe. Elishangolo sutapa. Mopo was sutapa. Namuzi Rukwamba, Gautanja mi wumbulo, Jiwane, Yabatuba Afrika. Navatuba wongwa nuapo, uyanga lifasi longa reta. Riri rite ni mitemuya tohun, naya damun. Riteni richambeli filo riti colonization. Ga urindilo neleno koto dea, fashangonu tanjami umbulo yo chinyarako. Ine rasa andazote, 
zwa tsiko zwa mupo ri ya baisala ri ne bana batuku ri ya baisala ah Thank you. Thank you, Makazi. Thank you for opening for us. Thank you for creating a sacred space for this conversation. So the format for tonight's event is a facilitated dialogue. So I'll pose some questions to our panelists uh, and those will be directed to a particular speaker, but an invitation to all three speakers. If you wish to answer, if there's a question that's posed to someone else, please come in. And just for the audience to say, um, I think for the first hour and 30 minutes, we'll have a closed conversation, but at some point we'll then offer time then for questions. So please feel free to forward those questions um, either on Zoom in terms of the chat box, uh, or for those of you that are on Facebook, please also uh, continue po uh, posting some of those questions for the end of the session. So as we get started, um, I'll start with method, if that's okay. Um, method, the work you do with Earthflow around seeds and food uh, involves a spiritual and sacred component. Could you tell us a bit about the first fruit ceremony you participated in recently and how that reflects an indigenous concept of nature and food? So if we can invite you to just share a little bit out of that, please. Okay, thank you, Wisi, uh, and thanks to Makazi for that beautiful official opening mm -hmm. and um, just taking us into that uh, sacred space, as you said, Wisi, um, because I have just been myself in a sacred uh, ritual last week on Saturday. And this is the, the experience I'll share with you today. But before I share that story, you know, as we talk about decolonizing our minds to redefine the correct relationship of us as people to plants and to the greater uh, spectrum of life. I feel greatly privileged to be participating in this uh, forum because the experience I had last week was precisely around this. So I have been working here in Pikita in Zimbabwe where I'm speaking to you right now from, I have been working here since 2015. And I've been working with uh, one particular community which is called Mutsinswa. Mutsinswa means the one who cries a lot. And over the period, I have worked with elders men and women to revive the knowledge around our own indigenous seeds and our own indigenous trees and other wildlife. And over the period, we have worked together to revive the sacred seeds of finger millet and pearl millet as well. And over the period, we, for the first time, having had the elders come together over the period to share the knowledge, to revive the knowledge, only last week, I participated in the ritual of first fruits. 
otherwise also known in other circles as the biotic ritual. And in this ritual, we offer what we have harvested. We offer this to the land. In other words, we offer this to the ancestors because the ancestors and the land are one. The ancestors live on the land and the land is our ancestor, the great ancestor. So in this ritual, we gather all the fresh farm produce to one place. And as we do that, we sing songs. And very interestingly enough, these songs are songs full of vulgar words. The elders haven't explained this to me, why that is the case. But song after song, it's vulgar word after another vulgar word. And I asked the elders why that, they, why that is the case. And they said, they will explain later. So we gathered all the fruits in singing and dancing, in ululation and in real happiness. Gathered all the fresh farm produce under the Mukamba tree, the African mahogany tree. To us, that's, that tree is sacred too, because all rituals, all family discussions, all tribal discussions happen under that tree. So we gathered all the fresh farm produce under the tree and then select few of the elderly men and women picked out of their own choice what they wanted from the whole pool and they carried just a symbol of all that to the female sacred side. So they had been discussion earlier before the ritual as part of reviving the knowledge and the practice. And the elders agreed that the first fruits would be offered to the female sacred side. They said, we, having forgotten this ritual for such a long time, have to start offering it to our mother, the female sacred side. And then next year, we will then be able to gather first fruits and then celebrate and offer in both the male and the female. So the elders selected a few um, of the farm produce and proceeded in singing and dancing. As I said, very vulgar songs. <laughs> and so they went and the rest of us remained and waited and waited. After a period, they came back in singing and in dancing. We all stood up to welcome them back. And we sat and they said just a few things that I won't say here. And they said afterwards, now it is time. We can eat. We will eat like baboons. We will eat like monkeys. We will eat like what the ants do. Nothing that has come here will be taken back home. If we can't finish, we will leave it. And the baboons will eat in the same manner that we are eating now. 
the goats of the village and the cows of the village, if they come, they will also eat. The monkeys will do the same. So we sat and we ate. We ate raw millet, raw finger millet. We ate raw pearl millet. We ate raw maize, raw ground nuts, raw jugo beans, you name it. That which we couldn't eat, we left there. The elder said, these don't become just plants when they come and we gather them here. They become part of our community because they link us, we who are alive, to those who have gone, those who are our soil, our ancestors. So that was my experience last Saturday, everyone. And I thought I would share this with you as we talk about decolonizing our relationships with plants and just hearing the elders say, the plants are not plants. They become part of the family and they link us who are alive to those, our ancestors who have gone who are the soil, who are the ancestors, on which soil we grow the same plants. And when we do not finish, we will leave the rest on the soil. Thank you. Apologies, so we're struggling with the mute and unmute button. Thank you for, for that method, right? So such a wonderful, inspiring entry into this conversation. So as I listen to you, there's a sense that um, what we might be able to reclaim as part of these conversations has yeah, such wisdom uh, and benefits for all of us. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna allow then for Makati to come in, right? So Makati, for you, you're the head of Zomola Mopo, which can be translated as the voice of nature. But Mopo is more complex in terms of its concept beyond nature. So if you can please share with us uh, what the meaning of Mopo is. Uh. The explanation today about Mupo, it needs us to have an outlook beyond what we have been taught, to do, go deeper to what we have been taught, because this is also the impact of colonizing our mind, that we no longer see in a holistic, in an interconnectedness. In Vavenda, Vavenda, the word Mupo, is very important. In Ruvenda language, Mupo is a word which explains all the natural creations of the origin, all the creations of that we call universe. In Ruvenda, Mupo is not a man-made thing. Mupo, when we look at the soil, is mupo. When we look at the stones, is mupo. When we see the river, is mupo. That sound which we hear in the river is a mumbo sound. 
when we see the plants from the grass, from everything that germinate and grow up to the big tree, is a mupo, it's not made by human being. When we see the forest, it's a mupo. When we see the mountain, it's a mupo creation. When we see up, up there, we see the stars. It's a mupo. It's the light of mupo. When we see the moon, it's a mupo. It's a mupo light. When we see animals, insects, reptiles, it's a mupo. When we see how all these interact and have a relationship that we need water from the river. It's a mupo waste. The river is mupo. Ourselves, we are mupo. When the mother has a big tummy, it's a mupo which makes that. When all this month, they are going, going up to when the baby is born. It's a mupo. It's a mupo. When we see human beings, we are mupo. When we see the moon communicating in women, where there is a flow, it's a mupo. Mupo is everything which we see and what is beyond. You can't touch Mupo. And Mupo is the ancestor spirit. When they go away, they go to the spirit. Mupo is also the spirit. Thank you. Oh, Maka. Uh, I just hear such an expansiveness of the force of life that you're describing. Um, and I think, yeah, hopefully as we deepen the conversation, we can come back to also just getting a sense of uh, how do we reconnect for those that haven't connected, right? And the work that's required around that. Uh, I'm gonna bring Mbu in, right? Mbu, as you listen to that, um, I think there's a part of me that's wondering. So listening to both method, describing the indigenous practices, and then listening to Mark Hadzi around the concepts of this expansiveness of life that she describes. How did we end up so far from these indigenous ways? And what happened to people's relationship with food and nature? Perhaps you can help us yeah, piece some of that together. Do you mind coming in? Oh, sorry. Is, is that me? Is it my turn, Bosi? Yeah, um, yes, it is. Please come in. Oh, I'm not sorry. sure you hear what uh, I was asking. I, I think I did. Mm. Um, I, I begin with a, a, an apology on behalf of the South African government for not providing me with reliable internet. So I'm in a rural area here in Gwazulu Natal in the southern part of the, of the province. Uh, Well, yeah, I think we've lost you there, or at least we're not able to hear you, or I'm not able to hear you. So I'm wondering if you are able uh, in to... In which Richmond. And like many other rural areas, and internet being one of them. So I was saying that um, I, I cannot actually function well here because my internet is unstable. If you can hear me, is there any way of switching off maybe your video that might support that? Uh huh. Uh, um, okay.
Great. Can we try now, Do you want to come in? It looks like you, and uh, you muted yourself again. So let's see if you can be unmuted. Okay. So how is this? Is it better? A little bit better. Let's give it a try. Thanks, Mbo. Please come in. Yeah. All right. So I was saying that um, this is due to. The Yeah, the internet is not playing well with us, Mpho. Uh, I might ask perhaps Method to come in and respond to that, if that's okay. The inadequacies of our, of, I cannot speak, and I'm beginning to wonder, wonder whether I'm... Can you still hear, Mrs. Busi? Uh, I keep hearing every second word, Mpho. Let's try one more time, and if not, um, let's see if we, we can offer you another solution. Let's try it one more time, Mpho. Okay, so technology is not supportive. Method, I'm not sure if you heard my question. Um, would you be able to come in or do I need to repeat that? Please just take the question again. Uh, let me start yeah. again, let me, let's try one more time. People to participate effectively with us. Okay, so Method, let's just give Mvue a chance and if not, I'll repeat the question, please. Mvue, please try. Can, we, can you hear me now? Yes, I could hear that part. How is this? We're hearing every second word. So I think if it's okay, Mvo, I'm going to pass the question on to Method and perhaps just ask um, Brittany or someone else to just follow up with you offline a little bit to see if we can change that. Cold, but let's, let's try anyway. Saying thank you very much for that invitation. Uh... Great, thanks. Method, what I was asking um, was this question around, so just listening to both your story, right? So just around indigenous practices and Mark Hatsi's description of the force of life that she, she was referring to. As we listen to that, the question might be around, how did we end up so far from these indigenous ways? And what happened to people's relationship with food and nature because of our departure from some of what you were describing and some of what Mark Hatsi is describing? Well, thanks, Busi. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a long way. Uh, <laughs> and, and I wouldn't answer it myself. I wouldn't answer the question myself. Um, I think what I would do is to share what the elders say about how things are and, and, and why we ended up where we are. I'm just coming from a community dialogue today uh, in, in a neighboring community to the one that we had the ritual last week. And we went round and round with the elders talking about why are we in the situation where we are now? Some said it is because the population has grown big some said it's because of technology. Some said we have become lazy. Some said um, things have changed. I mean, there are so many reasons that the elders say. But at the very depth of it all, one elder said, we are all seeing this diminishing of indigenous knowledge and practice. We are all experiencing it, young and old. It's happening in our eyes. We aren't stopping it. It's something of being forgetful, but also 
as one elder said, we are forgetting our home, forgetting who we are, that we are part of a much bigger family, which doesn't comprise only humans and electronic gadgets, you know, cars and cell phones and all those things, but that we belong to a much bigger community, which is the world. And that is, we forget that relationship. It's very easy for us to let things go because there is nothing to protect. And when, for example, we then engage Method, so do we now lose you? Okay, so method seems to have frozen. So yeah, no, technology is not being friendly today. Method, are you still able to hear us? Okay, so hopefully Method will come back. But uh, yeah, so that's just something in what Method was sharing that, um, yeah, so this idea, so you speak about the forgetfulness, right? And perhaps Makati can come in at this point, um, how we can reclaim some of this knowledge. Um, and Method also speaks to the idea of elders. So Makati, I'm wondering if you are able to come in. So would you be able to speak to the importance of the inter intergenerational learning and passing of knowledge from elders to young people uh, around the protection of biodiversity and cultural diversity? Uh, and yeah, and I think if you are willing to also just share um, around your name and the meaning of your name, and yeah, so how you were named and the relationship to your father's wish uh, in terms of um, some of the work that you're doing as well and how that connects to the ancestors as well. So if you're able to talk a little bit to that, um, so yeah, it, any part of that would be welcome to, for you to come in. Uh, uh, my name is Impatelini. I am the 11th child of my father from 24 children. I was born when my father was 74 years old. As my father was experiencing what we are talking today, that it is needed. Musi Zoralo, my father, he became a pastor, a priest in the church. But in more ways, the spirit wanted him to be a healer. He experienced so many difficulties. Criticized that traditional healing is wrong. It's a demon way is outdated, is no longer fit today. He struggles until he, he stopped going to the church after he became a traditional healer. He experienced so many problems. My father protected the mountain. My father protected the river, which was near our home. We always hear waterfall when we were sleeping, Mudzinga River, my father was criticized. My father protected culture. He was criticized. My father was a, the healer who do initiation school called Domba, now is Python. My father do this initiation school for men in the mountain, traditionally, 
this is a conversation which they said it is a conversation. It's not only a conversation. My father experiencing these difficulties. Through that, my father was stopped and taken away from his throne as a traditional leader because the government during apartheid from the what is imposed by colonial thinking because he deny all these agendas. They end up even taking him away from the throne. In 1969, I was born. He was 74 years. I am the eleven child. I am the fifth daughter. My mother come from a deep traditional family, the Davana traditional family. Then when I was born, my father named me Mpaterene. I believe so much on my name and my name is the ancestral task, which was given to my father to name me Mpaterene. I regard the children of my father special children because all of us from our names, we have special names which have a meaning. Mpaterene means build for me. Which means if you build for me, it means that I am tired. I can no longer build on my own. I believe so much that my father was saying, Patelini, rebuild. Build for me these traditional ways. Build for me to protect Mubo. Build for me to say no about the destruction of our ancestral past. My name means built for me. And I believe so much that I was not just given a name. My name is a role. My name is a task. And that's how my name is connected with my life. I went to the school built for me, which my aunt, my vein. The first time when my father said, this daughter is called in Paterin, it cannot disconnect me from standing up and saying it's wrong to say no to our tradition, to say no to our ancestral path, to say no when there is destruction of the mountains, the rivers, the land, to say no, even to contaminate our food by putting some of the things, because my father was also a traditional farmer. Food was coming from the soil. That is how my name connects with what I do. Thank you, Makati. Yeah, I think just this deep connectedness in terms of what you're saying around spirituality and then bringing it back to food, right? So I noticed that Mbu's back. Mbu, I'm not sure if you want to come in where you left off. Uh, and also if there's anything you've heard that you also want to respond to, that would be great. Yeah, it's hard to follow that. Um, mm -hmm. So no, th thank you very much for, for the, the, those powerful words. Um, my, my internet is still unstable, but I hope you can hear me now, Busi. Yes, much better. Aha, perfect. Yeah. Um, now let me begin, uh, I'll begin with a quotation from one of my favorite poets, um, Amy Cizé, who was a, a, a poet from the small island of Martinique in the Caribbean. My mouth shall be the mouth of those calamities that have no mouth. My voice, the freedom of those who break down in the prison hole of despair. So I love, I love this line because there is a lot in it. Uh, in fact, more than I know what to do with it. Uh, especially, I love the diets of silencing, of speech, of calamity and freedom, of prison despair and hope. Because I think that's what a conversation around plants, that's what it allows, allows us to, 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 to examine. Um, the, the importance of thinking about calamity when it comes to how we as indigenous people of this country 
relate to, to plants, how we relate to one another. So when it comes to the theme of decolonization and plants, I think that it can actually appear as a pipe dream, as something that is fictional, as romantic. If we only consider decolonization only as far as our relationship with plants goes, uh, when in fact the whole structure, um, the, things, the things that Mam Patilin is talking about, our distanciation from ourselves, from our culture, etc., uh, are all tied to this operating system that we have here. I mean, so many years after the so-called end of apartheid, Well, we were getting so deep into that conversation. I'm not sure if he's still there. So it seems that, yeah, again, the technology is not working with us today. But yeah, I think there's just so much that we were sharing. Uh, but yeah, maybe just to call the thread around the disconnection. And I believe Method is back. Method, are you back? Okay, maybe I got that wrong. Okay, so it looks like we're still trying to reconnect Method. Um, Makazi, yeah, so perhaps the, then it's just the two of us for a little while until everyone is back on. Um, so just based on what Tim was saying about the sense of disconnecting, um, I, and I think you were already also speaking to that, right? So it would be useful just to get a sense of when we talk about decolonizing, that, that can be sort of a big word for people, but based on your experience, what are some of the practical aspects of decolonizing the relationship of plants that we might wanna consider? Um, so how do we go about it? And so what are some of the practical things that you think would be important to consider? And also what are some of the positive impacts you have seen when people reconnect to indigenous foods and traditions? Uh, there is a requirement or the need which bring this word decolonizing. Mm. There is a lot of deeper understanding from the academic view, but ourselves, when we look at it as a basic understanding of this English word. Decolonization for me, when I understand it, it is a path which is leading us to, 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 to clean the mindset of an Africans the mindset of the indigenous all over the world, people. Because through colonization, there is this thing which has been planted in the mind. And when we go to the plant, it's in, it's in many aspects which we have been colonized on them. But as the plant is the root, Decolonization is a path which is leading us to clean or to unbrainwash our minds because our minds through colonization, through all experiences which we have passed through, they, our minds have been constructed to see the plants as the things which we consume. We are constructed to, to, to become consumers of plant. Because when we see the plant, we see that I can pick the fruit, I can pick the roots, I can pick the leaves, I can pick whatever is there to use it. We see the plant of the tree that is a timber that I have to harvest. We don't see the plants in a holistic way, where in an indigenous 
a plant is a holistic thing. A plant is not only to provide food. A plant is not only to provide a shade. A plant is more, 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 more. Like now, in Venda, we have important plants, which through the colonial thinking or agenda, we have been moved, we have been disconnected. Like this plant, Mupo, this is a plant, this is a finger millet, and this is the element of food. Our rituals, our spirituality, even if I go near the people, they will criticize me that I am doing demon things because they see the finger millet, if we use it for the ritual instead of just drinking mabundu, macheu, they will say Patereni is doing rituals. It is a very sacred plant. And you know what? Decolonizing the mind on the finger millet need to go straight to the point. Colonization bringing missionary to brainwash us the connection and the relationship with the finger millet by bringing the wine, the bottle of wine. Because what we do in the ritual using the finger millet is the same thing which happened in the church. It's the ceremony which happened in the church because we drink this finger millet as part of prayer, even though we say it's a part of the ritual. It's part of prayer. But the missionary, they come and they see that the vendor makazi we use the finger millet. is our strong element to communicate. And you go all over the world, even though I cannot know it's all over the world, but many parts, especially Africa and, and India, they say finger millet is a God's crop. Then they put wine on the shelf that you no longer do the, the, the ritual in the shrine using finger millet. You do the ritual in the building with the zincs and bricks. That is the structure of the church. And you no longer use finger millet, you use the wine, the bottle of wine. Which the wine disconnect us from the plant because they don't even pay attention on that wine come from the, from the plant. But the finger millet children, everybody know that you go to the cultivated land and harvest it as a plant before it become a ritual drink. We have the shrine. This is the plant which is, Afri that one which is African potato, where today, it needs to de be decolonized because people see African potato as a medicine to be harvested for the, for the healing only. But this is our shrine at home where we go to connect there spiritually and until we reach the, 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 the creator, the mother lineage, the father lineage and the creator on top. But this plant, we have been disconnected with it because the shrine, they, they said is wrong. Then we've been disconnected from the shrine where there is a plant, from the zipo where there is the forest. Our church is in the forest. Our church is outside at home, the shrine. But colonization take away from the repo, from the forest of repo to the building and from the shrine to the building. And they remove all these plants that I, now I am very, 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 I will defend this and I will defend because this is what make life. They put the book like this. I love it, the Bible, to read it because it's the story like I can write the story about my father and the grandfather. But they said, you use the book, you connect with the papers and the sentences. You don't have to connect with the shrine. And you do this book inside the, the room. While 
our spirituality is with the plants in the forest or a shrine at home outside on the soil where is the reason or oh, the natural creation not many made things like the book this is how decolonizing is important to the future generation and it, they're even scared when they do ritual at home you know they can't speak it at at school that we were drinking finger millet they can't even speak that they were in the sacred forest in the sleep you have to eat, do it hiding the other plant is this what we are putting in this plastic the vendor important plant which we don't see it as to consume it is a sacred plant which is the element which we communicate spiritually but they are thinking of colonial wanting to take us away our land wanting to take us our knowledge they said it's backward it's a demon it's outdated don't do it because when you do it you go to hell now i'm telling the whole world i rather go to burn in hell because of this because i'm not killing anyone i'm not destroying anything i'm not even not unethical because when you have an ethics you do ubuntu you don't create laws to brainwash people you don't create laws to take away the 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 the, the, the people in the real life of interconnectedness you don't create laws to brainwash people that you believe this while the hidden agenda you want to take away everything thank you what powerful words makazi um as i listen to you just yeah the strong sense of how food is spiritual right but also the sense of part of your work is restoring and making whole uh, those parts of us that have um have been broken and that yeah we've lost connection with so it's just huge gratitude for that i think we've got method back method with the last we saw um you were still talking about the idea of forgetfulness in terms of how we've been disconnected uh, to our food systems and you spoke about the elders i'm not sure if you want to continue that or if there's something you've heard from my cutie that you also wanting to respond to certainly i would like to uh, take from where mbaka left just the thinking of plants as having a user function that we can use plants um you know if if any one of you is seeing a plant right now you seeing either a tree i can see one through the window you can see grass or maybe a creeper or a flower outside through the window or it's probably in your house i just want to ask you to look at that plant an experience how you share breath with that plant that the the breath that flows in to that plant comes out flowing into you out of you back into that plant and between you and that plant that you can see in your proximity you sharing breath you sharing life and that makes the plant a companion a life companion not just to make timber as makazi said not just for food it is that mentality that doesn't recognize the mutuality and the friendship that is nature that exists between us and plants and then if we are in farming now then we start talking about even weeds but i was talking to my mother last night when she prepared a wild vegetable for me 
and she took me through the whole story about the plants that are in the field. They have been weeded to give the other preferred plants a chance to grow. They come back when the preferred plant is way up there. And she says, when they come back, now they are not weeds anymore. They are full. So she went to harvest a combination of weeds, wild vegetables, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise uh, known as weeds. She came, she prepared, and she brought the plants themselves. And she said, this leaf is that one. This leaf is that one. So uh, I'm taking it from where uh, my cards left, that the idea of seeing a resource in a companion, the idea of seeing a resource in a plant is the same idea that sees a resource in another person. And so yes, colonialism could happen. Yes, even slavery could happen because the idea of seeing a relationship where life exists has been lost. And I think it's a fundamental issue. Think of that time when, for some of you here, you have taken a holiday. You have probably gone to the Kruger National Park or to the Konaren Zoo National Park. Think about what that environment does to you, your mind, your stature, your, your everything. Often we want to take holidays because we want to go and reconnect. And we do that with these plants. We do that with these plants in exactly the same way we do with other animals too, with insects. And I think that's a fundamental um, issue that Makazi brought about seeing the usury function in everything, seeing ivory for an elephant. I mean, seeing an ivory in an elephant. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I, apologies that I, I got creeped out and so I may have uh, uh, missed out and on quite a number of things. And so I, I don't want to take you back, but I, I think let's go forward. Thank you. Thank you, thanks Method. And I might ask you to continue a little bit, right? So, because there's something in what you're sharing that sounds like, so if part of what uh, has, has um, disconnected us from nature is what sounds like a transactional relationship with nature, uh, with plants, with our food systems, what would it take to repair that? And I think some of your work is doing that, right? So what are some of the practical ways that we can look at decolonizing our relationships with plants uh, how do you go about it in terms of your own work um, and your own life? And so I think just hearing a little bit about that would allow us to see in what practical ways we're able to shift that. Thank you, Buzi. Um, the work we do is about reviving indigenous knowledge and practice. And some say we revive culture or we want to become more cultural. And when we do so, we run the risk of being accused of um, living in the past or going back to the past. But I want to show you why going back to indigenous knowledge and practice and culture is the work of the future and not of the past. We work to revive indigenous knowledge, traditional ways of knowing and understanding. And at the very core of those traditions is the understanding of how everything is connected to one another, that the river is connected to the mountain and the mountain is connected to the elephant. And the elephant is connected to the tree. 
the same tree that you and me are connected to. It is the original form of understanding how humans belong to this bigger community of life. And so when we say, let's go back to learn from indigenous knowledge, we are saying, let's refer to that text of our elders who used to do it and who can remember the understanding of being connected. So that once again, from now as we go forward, we go forward in the mode of being connected to life. So part of the work we do is to revive indigenous knowledge. And as, as I've explained, why do we do that? Because that's one of the references for us to reestablish the connection again. And number two, we also do nature experiential processes. Go to the world. And I would, I mean, I do that with, with uh, my children. I do that with children in my own family that we sit outside. Sit the whole night. Watch how sunset happens. Watch how the sun gives way to the moon, to the stars, to the Milky Way. And how the sounds evolve from sunset into midnight, into dawn. And when you do that, you begin to experience humility in the way that you are so minute in the vastness that Makazi described in Mupo. It is that relationship of humility that our elders understand without a compromise. And it is that which, when we do, we nurture life. We will nurture seeds that contain life. We will nurture um, plants that feed animals, plants that keep water, and everything gets connected. So experiencing nature, being in nature. As Thomas Berry says that nature is the primary text. The understanding that when human beings came into being, they came into being in a world that was already being and was already going. And that human beings came to belong and to participate in the processes that were already going and flowing. And so this is how the original peoples understood things and how they participated in the rhythms with celebrations and rituals. They are not things of the past. These are things of the future. <laughs> they are not demonic, Makazi puts it. They are not demonic. These are the things at the heart of celebrating life. When you see it and when you experience it. And that's part really of the work that we do. That when we nurture, a diversity of seeds that we nature, a diversity of food that we eat, but of plants that also feed the soil. The plants don't just feed people, they feed the soil too. The very same soil that feeds the plants feeds us, but the plants feed the soil too. And that is the relationship. And we forget it when we don't refer to how the elders understood that that's how it works. Wow, thank you. Thanks, Method. Yeah, I, I think I was just writing down so much of what you're sharing. Um, 
and yeah, what does come up, so it's just a strong sense what you're saying, this is the work of the future, right? This is not the past. Um, and how, how do we also then carry that in a way that this is part of the, the joy and the celebration and the hope of the future that we can build together through this work. Um, Makati, I see nodding happening there. I, I'm wanting to check what the nodding is about before I check if Mbu's back. It looks like Mbu's back, but Makati, are you want, I'm seeing some nodding. Do I wanna verbalize some of what's happening for you as you're listening to Method? Ah, about to sing the, the plants. Mm -hmm. About seeing them connecting with the mountain, connecting with the soil. They connect you with everything because these plants, you know, we, we, the girls, the daughters, the mothers, not woman, we are women. In Mubo, that connection is within women. Because when this connection happen, the moon communicate. The moon go to the mountain and communicate with the plants, the trees on the mountain. And this in geography precipitation happen. But imagine when you chop down the, the trees, you are killing even that elephant with method is seen. When you make the soil dry, you are even disturbing the women to communicate. And we, we think deeper because of the threats which comes around and because of all these tragedies which came with it. Putting our mind far from the reconnection. Do you know when you disturb the moon to communicate with the mountain and the trees there? up to the soil, up to the wetland, so that we get all what we want. We are also interfering with the seeds. Mm -hmm. I was nodding because when method take an elephant, the mountain and the soil that they are there for them and even us, I was nodding that because in, as part of intergenerational learning, we gathered the school children with the elders to do the ecological calendar mapping. Where, when they do this ecological mapping, they start with the moon, the stars, the mountain, the plants, the animals, the insects, and they, they, they end up understanding that this is the ways of the present. When we say there is no water in the tap, children, they who do the ecological mapping, they know that it's because we have disturbed. The, the, the elephants are dying, no compost, no fertilization. I'm just taking the elephant because we method talk about elephant. And we are disturbing even everything to grow that we get water to flow in the river. I was nodding because it's a big connection with the method, which method was indicating. Thank you, mm. method. Mm. Thank you, Makati, yeah. And maybe we'll remain with you, Makati. I see we lost Mbu again. We would have really loved to, to hear from him. But Makati, yeah, so I have sort of a big question and I might sort of premise it with a little bit um, of just understanding our history, right? So, um, so it might be important to talk about how in terms of our history and an ongoing reality, the theft of indigenous plant knowledge for commercial gain usually by either white people or global North corporations is part of our reality. So pharmaceutical companies patent indigenous med uh, medical plants and food manufacturers incorporate indigenous ingredients into products. Uh, and we see in academia as well, researchers may gain degrees and prestige for the work of, of indigenous plants. Uh, and in most cases, the indigenous knowledge holders are not acknowledged. Uh, and do not benefit in any way, or they may even suffer the loss of the access to such plants. So when we're talking decolonizing, um, it is not about commercializing indigenous plants, but about learning to see plants differently. 
So could you speak a little bit about this problem in terms of, um, yeah, both in terms of the history of this and, and how it plays out in the uh, present and the trauma that that causes in communities? Uh, hey, this is a, 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 a huge thing. Because this thing is not only coming with the, 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 the plant itself or what we can touch is because of the way indigenous knowledge is handled is handled you know in the communities we like ourselves the mupo uh, group of people we we will be doing with this knowledge as part of intergenerational learning as we can uh, uh, shorten its description like myself, I started this essay, learning from the elders as they are the library of knowledge. Opening spaces for the younger children to learn. I found teachers coming because in the curriculum or syllabus, they were teaching what we are doing. But this problem is not on the cooperative or whatever we call them. The first thing about the knowledge holders is the way when we do this work as a part of our intergenerational learning and enjoying to be with the elders before they die. The other people from other places. I used to be having something to say white people because I don't see it's a good description, it's a white people. We have to find a word because is not all of them. <clears throat> this include the black people. They come find us there in the community doing our work. I have to be honest. They come and get interested and start to organize us that we become like an NGO or a group which has to register. And they said they bring funding. And when they bring funding, this is part of another colonizing the mind. We become dependent. That's why when we, they feel that they have fed up, they have collected our knowledge, they go away and start to bring the laws which are not our indigenous law. Like myself, they could say, Pate, we have employed you, we are firing you, we are dismissing you because they want to solve problem in their own understanding. I'm saying this affect knowledge holders because other elders in our, in our group, Zomalamupo, they are dying with pain that the time in which they were enjoying without money coming in. There are people who come and disturb it. They end up even looking for a lawyer to defend their agenda to defend their agenda against the spirituality, against our ancestral spirit, because they see the spirit. This is what is the problem. The way indigenous knowledge system is taken away is the same way where the land, the territory, the whole mountain, Makati, can you hear us? It looks like we lost Makati. Or she's frozen. Uh, I think in the interest of Makati, can you still hear us? So while we're struggling with Makati, maybe Bu, I see you back. <laughs> We're taking yeah. turns, it looks like. Mbu, please come in. We, we're so out of time, but 
I think, yeah, you were in the middle of sharing something. I'm not sure if you want to continue uh, or yeah. if there's anything you've heard so far that you want to contribute to. Sure. No. So when I, when, I, when I was off, I begged the internet God to just let me in so I could listen, you know, uh, because every time I tried to say something, the internet would shut me off. Um, so let me try sneak in just a, a few sentences quickly. Uh, first, just gratitude. If, even though the internet has been playing havoc with me, I'm still appreciative of the, of the event. I mean, the holding of this gathering alone is really extremely powerful. So thank you for organizing, and I hope these conversations will continue, that this is not a once-off event. So the, the point that I really wanted to stress for me was that the, the work around plants, around in, indigenous plants, cannot really take place unless we take into context the idea of conquest, right? That the struggles that we're, we're talking about, and I hear Umam Petileni right now talking about the colonization of the mind, talking about that race does not really matter too much if, if we are still operating in the context of conquest. So the reason we are so removed from our ancestors, from our elders, is really because of this fact that we live in a, in a period of conquest, even, even though apartheid has ended, we are still in this period of conquest where we are not connected. We cannot be connected to plants because we're not connected to one another um, because of the current environment in which we live. So, so for me, that, that's it, you know, when we, when we think about plants, yes, rose must fall. I, I quote a good friend of mine, Chris, who, who says rose must fall, R-O-S-E, Rose must fall, yes, and uh, we, need, we do need to think about uh, how we uh, re-evaluate our relationship with indigenous plants, with all kinds of plants, but that cannot take place unless we um, uh, take into account the context in which we live, the fact that we live in a, in a country that celebrates white supremacy still, that we are holding this conversation in the English language, I mean, let's start there. Uh, these are some of the issues that we need to confront. The, the idea of decolonizing plants alone, outside of the context of decolonizing everything, for me, that's just a, it's just a pipe dream. That cannot happen because uh, our minds, our, our economy, our society, our culture says to us, we are not people, we are not human beings. Um, and therefore, our relationship with one another and our relationship with plants follow the same kind of mechanism, the same kind of mechanism of conquest. Um, I'll just share a little story to illustrate the point that I'm, that, that, that I'm, that, that I'm emphasizing. Most of the stuff that I know about indigenous plants comes from work that was done by an amazing woman in the town of Mtubatuba, uh, known as Gokoko. She passed away, uh, sadly, in December last year. But I remember her telling me a story once that she was selling her, her muffins made with indigenous plants in the town of Mtubatuba. So she gets there, black people are walking past, white people are walking past, nobody's buying because they know that the, 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 the muffins that she is selling are made with umsuzwana and other indigenous herbs. So they had no interest in buying them at all until a white woman drives by in a bucky. And she says to her, oh, Coco, hello, how are you doing? What's going on? And Coco says, no, I can't sell my, my muffins. I've been here all day. And the white woman takes the crate of muffins, puts it on the back of a bucky, and Coco says they were gone in a few minutes. Why? Because when a white person is holding the thing that we hold dear, that thing transforms its value. The relationship that people have with that thing suddenly is transformed because a white person has put, has, has put a magical hand on it. So unless we change that kind of relationship in my view, unless we ourselves are able to come to terms with the fact that we are still heavily colonized, that our minds are sordid, that the, 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 the land on which we live is full of blood, the food that we eat is full of blood, that conquest still continues. I mean, unless we take that as a starting point, everything else for me is a waste of time because the, the land that we live in, um, I am farming on a slope here in Richmond. Uh, we don't have land. 
Yet the farmers next to me, one farmer has 3,000 hectares of land where he operates. Another has 1,000 hectares of land where he operates. And we are crowded here. There isn't enough land for all of us. So, so for me, the larger point is that when we think about plants, plants help to root us, to show us where things have gone amiss. And for me, that area is conquest. Thank you, Mbu. I'm so glad the internet gods allowed you to come back in, right? Because um, that's pulling so many threads together. Um, so there's a huge part of this that is about understanding our past, how that impacts the present, and how hopefully what's the question in terms of what's the future we're wanting to shape together. Um, so we've got a few minutes left and I'm wanting to just check. I know method, is there anything you want to add? So I think in particular, we are also wanting to leave with some things that also give us hope in terms of what's possible, right? So uh, is there anything you might share in terms of seeds in particular around seed saving and how to contribute to, how those contribute to resilience? So before we open up to questions from um, anyone who's participating. Thank you, Busi. Um... So one of the things we do practically is to promote what is now known as agroecology, um, what others call farming God's way or nature's way. And I'm starting from there because you have spoken about seeds and resilience. And what we learn from nature is that the forest is diverse. It is composed of various plants and, you know, trees, grasses, shrubs, and so on. That different animals eat selectively. What the giraffe enjoys is not what the elephant enjoys. And in good years where there's a lot of rain, and I'll be very specific to my area here in Bikita, like this year, there was a lot of rain. We will not harvest a wild fruit called me. In very dry seasons, that fruit is abundant. Amarula is also abundant in those seasons. So I'm telling this story so I can go back to why the work to revive seeds is key. It is precisely because in our own farming ways, we knew and understood that the farm is not only a farm because there's raised on it. And so we can apply a pesticide that destroys any other plant that is in maize. And what would happen if you have destroyed all plants to leave maize and the amuen comes and destroys all the maize and then everything becomes a desert. So the work around reviving diversity of seed that we do is to say the farmer has the seed that produces food in drought years. The farmer equally has seed that produces food in good rain season. And when the farmer does that, they have the best of all conditions. They can be in a worst case scenario where if, for example, they have only planted maize, like in our area here, this is very dry. If you have planted only maize and it is dry, you will lose everything. But if you have revived a diversity of seeds, you've got millet, you've got finger millet, you've got pearl millet, you've got sorghum, um, you've got uh, jico beans, you've got sesame. And these are all seeds I'm talking about that we, we have revived here. There is even a, a seed that I, I had not known from the time I was born and it's called Soboda here. 
which has been revived too, and it's being proliferated. All farmers are taking it to plant it. And I'm telling the story of farmer resilience is not something that we can see in nature. Nature teaches us wherever there is diversity, there's resilience, because the forest doesn't diminish because there's a drought. The forest doesn't diminish and end because there is a flood. In either ways, the forest remains the forest. And some plants will die in one season and come up in the other, and die in one season and come up in the other, and the forest remains. And that's what, in reviving a diversity of seeds, we say the resilience of the forest becomes the resilience of the farmer too. Thank you. Thanks for that method. Yeah. So, and I, again, just listening to you, it just allows us to be able to imagine into a different way of being, right? So this future that you were talking about. Um, we are wanting to allow people to come in with questions. So I think there's been questions that, uh, so one in particular that's come in, but before we do that, um, can I request, I'm assuming it's Brittany to come in uh, we were just wanting to also just address some of the things that came up leading up to the setting up of this conversation. Uh, Brittany, are you able to come in? Yes, thank you, Busi. Um, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, you are. Great. Um, thank you everyone for this amazingly uh, interesting and stimulating conversation. I think it's been a very important to beginning to something that needs to continue. Um, we just wanted to address something that came up preceding the event. Uh, there were some comments on Facebook about the absence of any San or Koi speakers on the program. And we would like to acknowledge that this is a significant blind spot in the program. Uh, and we understand that this reinforces the exclusion that is very familiar to people whose voices are not being heard, but really need to be heard in spaces like these. So we wanted to apologize for perpetuating that exclusion and we wanted to offer our commitment to do better by very mindfully expanding our networks to ensure that we are able to have a more inclusive panel uh, in whatever event we organize next. Um, so before we open up to comments from everyone, uh, we just wanted to take a moment and ask if there are any members of San Okoy communities present. Uh, and if so, if they would like to make any comments, uh, we will open the floor to them first. Thanks. So I'm not sure, Brittany or anyone else who's able, uh, Stefan, if you're able to see if anyone's wanting to come in, please let us know. Uh, so I'm not seeing anyone at this point. Um, yeah, we'll create more time if that's okay. But uh, I think let's go ahead with the first question and just inviting others if there's comments or questions that you want uh, the panel to also address, please come in. So the one question that we have um, and addressed to all the panelists, how can those in cities connect to Mopo? Uh, how can we remedy the separation of those in urban areas from nature? And it would be good to hear from all, all the panelists if, if you have something to share around that. Can I check? Um, Makati, are you willing to start first or? Actually, yes. no, I'm not. Yeah, please. Makati, are you able to come in? Uh, for the people who are in the towns, in the urban area, I learned the 
process of uh, ecological mapping of the territory. O ala shango la abo uvazitavani makoleni hote. I also learn the for those people who are in towns or in urban area to connect back process of ecological mapping of their territories where they were born. Even in town, if we still have elders, elders will come with the knowledge how was the area before what we are seeing today. And they will also map the present. How is it and compare with the, we call it ancestral territory. And together these two, they will combine them to do the future map. How do we want to live? This is where the children will want to say, we want to see a, th a, a thing called river. We want to see a thing called mountain. Because if we just go to the children and say, what, what is the biggest mountain in South Africa? They will just mention the name of the mountain. They, they are not having that learning to connect back to Mopo. That's my answer to that. And this is it. the deep, deep knowledge which the elders, the youth, the teachers, the, 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 the people from different uh, 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 departments in the government, if they participate in that because it's, it's in the form of participating, then the whole understanding will come in and this is where they will see what is MUPO. Uh, Thank you, Makatia. Uh, and I think, yeah, so the, I think the, those are some of the things that are useful for people to start thinking about uh, in terms of taking responsibility for what we can contribute. Um, can I check, um, Vu, do you wanna come in next? Yeah, no, I, I would simply just say um, to that question, I think it's a false dichotomy that if you are in the city, you are outside of nature. Nobody is outside of nature. I mean, that's that. that I think is a is a is a is an, is an amazingly uh, limiting and uh, um, uh, you know troublesome distinction that the colonial and capitalist mentality has brought into our thinking. That anybody can be outside of nature. How is that possible? We are nature ourselves. So it's just a matter of deepening one's connection to 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 oneself and to other people and to um, whatever environment one finds themselves in, whether it's in the city or in the countryside. Nature. We are nature. Nature is everywhere. So the idea that one is removed from nature is, I, I think, really for me, really worrying because I don't think such is possible. Wherever one is as a human being, you can't be removed from nature. It's it's your relationship with, with whether you think um, you, you conquer nature, that nature is something that you can possess, uh, it's, nature is something that you can have, uh, but if you have a humble relationship with the world, with the universe, I don't think one can conceive of oneself as being outside of nature. It's, it's just one of those binaries that the capitalist Euro modernity has, uh, has given us. So powerful, thank you. Uh, and Method, do you want to come in also on the same question? Certainly, certainly, we see. Um, so from a very practical perspective, something that I have tried to do with my own children in the city is to plant, to have plants. And to allow each child to have a look at a plant every day, if they can't, every two days, if they can't, every one week. And when they do that, and this is what I've experienced, just how amazing they recognize how the plant is a living thing. So we planted a pumpkin uh, seed with my son, we watered it over a period of time into flowering and it fruited. And 
when it did, my son came to me and he said, but daddy, do you recognize that this plant is clever? I said, why? And he said, it has hidden its baby under its leaves. It's because the pumpkin, the small pumpkin was all covered by the pumpkin leaves. And he read it that the pumpkin plant is clever. It's protecting and hiding its baby. And I think these are some small things as Mvuyo said, that we are not, we, we can't be outside of nature because that's, that's our very nature, that we are nature ourselves. But to nature, that relationship is to be present and to fully participate. So some things we could do even in urban areas recognize when it's a full moon recognize when it's it's the new moon at times it's difficult even to experience the milky way because there's so much light in urban areas but one day all thanks to escom with the lord shedding and my children saw the first shade made from moonlight, not trees, that trees can produce shade from sunlight. And so I'm saying small things. Let's take the children out, show them the moon, show them the stars. The stars have got names. <laughs> in, our, in our cosmology, stars have got names. The full moon has got a name. The new moon has got a name. You are in town, you are in the village where I am right now. The moon is there. <laughs> the stars are there. We got flowers in our houses. I, do, I don't mean the dead flowers, those uh, plastic ones. I mean, if we have live plants in our houses, we can recognize how these plants recognize us too when we recognize them. And these are small things we can do. We nurture that. And we recognize that we become friends with plants and with the cosmos. Ah, oh, thank you, Method. Yeah, right. So this idea of nurturing that relationship sounds so powerful, right? And some sounds like something that can be needed for all of us. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, yeah, you can say message brought to you by ESCOM when you were saying the putridity of load shedding there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I know that someone else was gonna come in, Zuleika uh, and then Siko, please. Zuleika, do you, wanna, do you wanna come in? I'm not sure if we can okay. unmute you. I'm here. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, firstly, Ngia Bonga, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I think this was exactly the conversation I needed to hear today. Um, I'm from uh, KZN, uh, but I'm speaking to you from the Netherlands where I'm doing my PhD. Um, and sometimes I receive messages and they come out in poetry. And this morning I woke up with a poem in my head, which is very short and I'd like to read it to you. And it says, in a forest that has been logged for 500 years, the last tree standing was given pencil and paper and told to tell their story. <laughs> and <laughs> this relationship between decolonizing the mind, um, between our connection to land, sea, sky, and also um, to spirituality is something that I'm working with in my research. And um, I was so happy to hear uh, about the finger millet and the connection between India and Africa, because that's always something that I'm reaching for. I'm trying to find how do these two 
um, pathways of spirituality or these two ways of being in the world outside of a Western way connect so that we recognize the difference, we recognize the beauty of our ways of knowing and being in the world without trying like the Western way does to constantly assimilate that one has to take over the other. Um, and so in, in India, finger millet is called ragi. And I'm so excited to go and find out more about the spiritual purpose of it, how to grow it. So I'm really happy that to learn that. But also this idea of mupo, which also in the, in the yoga philosophy of how uh, yoga, which means union, to bring into union, to bring yourself, the individual, into union with the cosmos. It is mupo. It's just a different word, but it's speaking to the same relation. So, um, yeah, this, this, to explore this, this uh, connection to plants and to land more. I recently um, got a little plot of land in a community garden here in the city of The Hague, where I live. And I had all of these questions before I started, like, what does it mean that this is Dutch soil, like the soil of the colonizer? What does it mean that this is land that because of their system of canals, they've actually reclaimed it back from the sea. They've, they've manipulated to get the land back from earth, from mother nature. So, um, but the beautiful thing is once I put my fingers in the soil and I started to plant the seeds, the land is innocent. The land is not Dutch or African or the land is, it's, it's something much, much more. But of course that's the utopian world that we don't live in. We live in a land of borders and of land as a resource and of extraction and of taking and taking and taking. So um, yeah, I think for us as South Africans, the most important thing with reclaiming our knowledges and connecting our, our different genealogy of knowledges is the potential for healing. And the healing is so much needed in our lands. I feel it, I was there, um, I just got back like a month ago and it's, it's the way everybody panicked about alcohol no longer being available. And this like massive trauma that none of us want to deal with, but just gets carried from generation to generation. So, yeah, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but um, we just have to tr trust the lessons of the land and the soil and the plants will teach us. Thank you for giving me the time. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, and yeah, there's just something there about, um, yeah, the, the sense of all indigenous traditions uh, recognize the interconnectedness, right? So hopefully, how, how do we bring that together? So what's the ability to connect all life in this work? Yeah. Um, so before I, I allow for the panelists to have the final closing comments, can I ask uh, Siko to come in as well, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, Busi. As my um, system here tries to somehow connect um, my video or to start my video. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Um, nevertheless, that's that's okay. Uh, what 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 I wanted to to ask perhaps is um, look at the the language, the importance of language. Um, and why it is important for us to, to perhaps focus or refocus um, on its importance. I think um, it was um, Vuselelo who touched on the, 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 the medium um, that we are communicating on this platform. Um, and the hosts, I think, um, or the, the uh, coordinators of the event um, and the connection thereof. But I think that there's a, there's a need for us to, to create language around what we are talking about. Um, I, I often um, see people uh, praising or um, talking about sustainability and sustainable, uh, sustainable development goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you, if you look at nature, nature by its design is not sustainable. It's regenerative. 
um, it, it, it continues. It, 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 there is no point at any time where nature gets to and it says, well, we, I'm now sustainable. Mother nature is now sustainable. Um, so I, 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 I say that because I think in the fly, it speaks about trying to create some sustainable level of, of um, uh, state. Um, so, so I think that there's still also enough uh, time for us to look at language around what we are talking about here. And I think you, you've got brilliant minds in, on your panel here who can actually direct us um, and, and start creating some sort of repository or even just new phrases. I, th I think I'm, I'm sustainable out um, at this point um, because it's, 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 no, no one can even tell you what, what it actually means. Um, uh, so so we, we actually need to now start looking at what is it, what, what is it that we're talking about? Are we, are we talking about building a sustainable future or a regenerative future that encompasses, um, uh, um, because I think Bucerello Method, um, Pachelene did touch on that, that we are part of nature. We, we are one with nature. So there's no ways we, 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 we want to build a sustainable future. Um, and I think that is the project that needs to, be, to happen. Um, so my question there is to the panel, um, is it a, a sustainable project to, to look at um, uh, uh, reframing um, and creating new language around that? Or is it a process that would be regenerative that we can actually start now and um, pass over or pass on um, to the future generation to continue that journey? Um, but I think language is very important and um, it's critical that we get that right because um, it helps us in, in getting the message across. Um, and um, I, I, I think we, we, we've lost that connection because of the language. The language has become a barrier, um, but we, we, we actually can reclaim that in, in this uh, project of uh, decolonizing and de etc d sustainability etc cetera, etc cetera. i think there's uh, um there's 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 a need for us to re um more than to d um uh, so but um perhaps that, that that was just my 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 two cents to the to the conversation and thank you for um giving me the space to 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 share um thank you so much Thank you. Thanks, Siko. And I think with that, yeah, we completely out of time, but I am wanting to allow the panelists to respond particularly uh, to Zuleika and uh, Siko's statements. I'm going to also just include two other questions that did come in, uh, if any of you are able to include those. Uh, so whose voices need to be included in protection of Mopo through policy and how to document and share traditional knowledge without losing dignity? and traditions. So if there's a way of including any of that in your closing statements, um, yeah, so if we can just allow for, yeah, I think we've got about five more minutes uh, in order to close off before we do our final things. Um, can I mix it up this time? Can I start with Mbu and then uh, we'll end with, uh, with Makatsi? Yeah, no, thank you. Those are uh, just amazing, uh, powerful interventions, uh, Zuleika and Siko. So um, I, I, would, I would just say maybe for me that maybe just touch on the question of language that Siko um, uh, is directing uh, us towards. And I, I, think, I think you basically nailed it, Nomdai. In the basing, it says, cool, Yona Lena is true Sasgutulazi, Lubasam Kogak Pella, Omangabum to Kulmangamaka, Mama Kulis Lung, or sustainability Labukulmanga. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the, the, the fact that I, mean, I think in our, in our language, I speak Zulu as my, as my first language, there is so much great wisdom there and conceptualization that is already there. Uh, if you take, for example, the names of plants, um, I just discovered a plant that I didn't know before, so I looked it up. And it turns out it's called umsinsana. It's a short herb, uh, which is related, of course, to umsinsi, which is 
the royal tree um since August Milena, etc. So um since I, I looked it up and I was like, wow, I'm amazed this this plant here. And it turns out this plant is named has a has a has a Latin name because of obviously Europe has to name and classify. It is named after a guy, Humenea. It's called the Erythina Humenea, uh, of course, named after Hume, right? So, but it turns out the way that our people used to name things. Uh, um, Sinzana. It was um, Sinzana because it was related to, in, in, in look or in terms of the flowers, it was related to the Umsinzi. Or uh, other plant, uh, other pl common plant names, Istrishamli, a fire extinguisher, so called because it's a medicinal plant that is used to reduce inflammation. Unzogumbili, known as two days, it's a herb that is used for quick healing when you have sores and wounds, etc. Uh, so there's a kind of sociality in the in the language that we use when we are naming plants because we understand our relationship. Our ancestors understood the relationship that they had with these plants, with these beings, right? So the idea that you could possess, that you could name something after yourself is just ridiculous. So in, in language, I think there are already indications of how we can reimagine our connectedness to one another and our connectedness to nature because the language is already there. So because we were taught to see ourselves as a people of deficit, we always think that when we are looking for something, we have to go to Europe, we have to find an English word, we have to find an English concept in order to describe that which was already there before. So, so for me, that is important. So I want to thank you, Siko, for, for highlighting this point because the, there in language, are already ideas that our people already had to consider, to think, to imagine our relationships with ourselves and with all other beings that are around us. So in conclusion, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, although the internet was trying to make this difficult, but I'm glad that we were able to, help to hold this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Mbo. Yeah, right. So it's the limitations of time and the internet. It feels like another conversation is, is definitely warranted. Uh, Method, do you mind coming in and any of those questions or comments that came in? Uh, and in the interest of time, if I can request, if we can limit it to two minutes, please. Thank you, Busi. Um, yeah, I, I think I would start off where Mbuyo left that the same naming convention for plants in your place is the same in our place. Plants are named by a prefix mu for most trees. In our language, they have a mu, M-U prefix, which describes somebody who can, that's the prefix you know, somebody who can and or don't do this. So I'll give you an example of, I spoke about weeds earlier on and my mother brought a, a wild plant called Musarima. So the name of the plant is Musarima. It's saying don't plow. And what it says is that if you don't plow, then that plant germinates or don't weed. So that plant, that plant survives. So I really want to echo what you said uh, about how naming language is key to this. And link it to uh, the other question about which other voices? I say it is the voices of the elders. Those voices are not heard. This is where the knowledge resides. This is where the cosmology is, is, is vested. Those voices are needed. And somebody asked, how do we document this? And I mean, at the risk of uh, <laughs> being cheeky, I would say, we have got so much written. What's needed is the practice. Mm -hmm. Let's write less, let's revive the practice. Let's live it. If we're talking about relation to plants, let's do it. Let's not read because plants talk to you, they interact with you. 
So writing, yes, but. Thank you. Thanks, Method. Yeah, and again, just the limitations of time. This conversation needs so much more time. So I know we meant to end it now at six, uh, but I'm gonna allow for Makazi to come in, right? And apologies for those that are needing to leave. But I think, it, yeah, it's important just to really hear um, the wisdom of Makazi as we close. Makazi, any comments based on some of the questions and the inputs that we, uh, we heard from others? Uh, the voices are needed. I think the voices of the universities play a huge role. Then go back to the voices of the curriculum designers. From there, policy makers, policy makers, all department, not only South Africa, if all over the world, they will use the voice what the university is taking out. And if the university raise their voice in a holistic view, this is what we are saying it has been needing decolonization. It will come out. And this is where communities and the younger generation will learn holistic view of plant because universities, academic researchers, you have the task to bring back the knowledge before the elders dies that plants forest, it is like a mother who is pregnant. If you kill that mother, you kill everything, including the moon. That's my last statement. The moon cannot communicate and function if we lose the plants. That need holistic research from the elders before they die. Ah. Oh, thank you, thank you, Makadzi. Uh, I just wanna thank you all, the, thank all the speakers. Um, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for doing this work on behalf of all of us. Uh, so for continuing to hold the thread of the past to the future that we're wanting to create together. Um, and yeah, so it, I, I just realized the limit of time and the internet, but this feels like a conversation we should be having often and hopefully that we can continue in other forms. And just to say just some of the comments that have been coming in, uh, just the benefit of this for everyone who's participated. So just huge gratitude for that. Uh, and with that, I'm wanting to hand over to, uh, is it Claire or Brittany that's coming in now? Hello. Hi. Hi, Claire. Thanks. It's me. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the speakers for making time. Um, thank you, Busi, um, for your beautiful holding of space. And um, thank you to each of the speakers for just the depth of presence um, from everyone. Um, and thank you to Goethe again for their support for this event and for the previous events. And this video will be available on, sorry, give me a second, on the Facebook page of the Goethe Institute, um, Goethe Institute Johannesburg, as well as on YouTube. So please share with friends and colleagues and um, whoever may have missed it. And, um, and this forms part of Goethe's Sustainable Together program. Um, so thank you very much. And Brittany says, thank you everyone. And that you can find the recording on the Goethe Institute Facebook page and YouTube. Thank you, have a beautiful evening further and um, 
Yeah.